So let me share my screen. All right, so this is the resume writing workshop. Um, and the goal is really not to just improve your resume, but to make it so that you have a better chance of landing an interview based on your resume. So if you guys can just introduce yourself in the chat and share your occupation or industry that you're looking to work in um, and some sort of geography like city or county. Um, and you can also share how you found your most recent job or your first job. And I will just share in the chat that I work in affordable housing um, in San Francisco. And most of my jobs I found actually, my first job I found from a job fair. Um, and then many other jobs I found online, especially through Craigslist. And at any time during the presentation, feel free to ask questions in the chat. So basically there's two main types of resumes out there. Um, one is chronological, where you typically have your contact information at the top, uh, followed by an objective and a summary of skills, which usually has traditionally been at the end of people's resumes, but I recommend moving it up to the top um, these days. And then that is followed by a list of your places of employment and your job functions and achievements chronologically reversed. Um, and then with some education, certifications, volunteer work, et cetera, at the end. Um, but there's another type of resume, which some people have, which is a functional resume, where you, you can see in the purple part, instead of having your places of employment and job functions, that job functions actually get categorized um, with the um, most relevant categories first based on the job that you're applying to. And then your places of employment and achievements just become a list uh, at the end. <clears throat> so here's a sample of a chronological resume where this person worked at three hospitals and they listed their job titles with their uh, job descriptions, functions, and things that they did there. And then this one is a sample of a functional resume, which I would recommend for certain people where your position, if your job title has remained the same from place to place where you've worked, you can consolidate the information into this type so that um, someone reading, reading your resume doesn't have to read the same thing over and over at different workplaces or in a, um, in some fields where it's pretty much standard categories of skills that you would have. So in this example here, they have administrative support and everything they've done related to that, customer service and reception. Um, and then lastly, management and supervision. So you are able to grasp quickly that this person has supervised staff. Um, and then at the bottom, they just list their employment history uh, and the different companies where they worked, which I would still include the dates there. So here's the two side by side where you can see the difference. Um, and it, I think most people have a chronological resume, but sometimes it could be helpful to think about whether or not you want to switch it to a functional resume or just keep it chronological, but just to let you know the two are out there. Um, and I'm just going to look in the chat to see who is here. So we have some folks. Oh, someone who found their job on Indeed, um, Craigslist, library assistant, Healthcare, senior project manager, information software, engineering, um, instructional technologies, San Francisco, internship, medicine, 
doctor, doctor's license in China, um, nonprofit after a long break. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, and that'll be useful later when we do a sample job search. So today, what I kind of want to walk through is we're going to put on our human resources hat to pretend that we are in the role of the hiring manager. Um, because that's really where you'll see whether your resume is strong or not in its current state and whether there are some things that you think you need to change in it. So if we look at these two candidates, if we are the hiring manager, candidate A is on the left versus candidate B is on the right. If you are just wanna put into the chat, which of these two candidates you think sounds like a stronger candidate for this role of PR manager. Um, and yeah, a couple of folks are saying candidate B. So interestingly, these could be exactly the same candidate, right? They have exactly the same experience, but the difference is that candidate B gives us important information. They tell us quantity, scale, the volume, the frequency of their work, and it really makes them sound like a stronger candidate. Um, so adding how many and how often makes a big difference in being able to compare you to the candidate next to you who has who may have the exact same experience. Um, which is why step one in your own, if you, if you have your resume with you, um, resume self audit is to add numbers to your resume wherever you can. And so just kind of pause for three minutes so that if you want to pull up your resume, you can kind of exit the full screen of this um, Zoom webinar at the top right, or if you press escape on your keyboard and you can just pull up either your LinkedIn and make live changes or your resume file, or if you have it printed in front of you. But um, here are some places on your resume where you can add numbers. Um, you can add numbers to your job functions. So some things that you did on a recurring basis that were every day, every week, or every month, uh, large ongoing services. So answering the questions, how many, how frequently, how many people did you process? What was the volume? How many did you train? How, if you were at the front desk doing support, how many people did you support? Uh, were you in a professional office or what kind of office? How many people worked for you? How many people were on your team? Um, how often did you do certain tasks? So really just everywhere you mention a job function, can you add a number of some sort? And this is not just frivolously adding numbers everywhere. The really the goal at the bottom, which is highlighted, is you want to show leadership you want to show depth in your work, um, the ability to handle higher, higher volumes than others, the ability to be more efficient than others. You just really want to, like if you have the experience, you want to give people a full description of what experience you did have. And then if you have projects on your resume, what were the outcomes of the projects? How many people or teams or offices were impacted by, did, or, who, how many do you have to work with? Um, and then in terms of achievements, if you list achievements on your resume, how much did you earn the company? How much did you save the company? What percentage increase or decrease? Did you help them grow? Did you help them downsize? Like whatever it is, um, those are all different places where you can add these numbers. So in the two examples I just showed, um, one person here under their lead business analyst role, they said, identify key roadblocks and propose effective solutions for a $55 million project, not just a project that saved the hospital a million dollars. So that's pretty great compared to someone who did not include the numbers and just said they did a project that saved the hospital money. Um, and, and they also said that they were promoted after just 11 months of an employment. 
Um, and then the other person provided telephone support, investigated and resolved billing problems for an 18 member manufacturer's buying group, which is a lot more impressive than like if it was only two. Um, it's probably less experienced than someone who supported a 200 member manufacturer's buying group. So the numbers just make a huge difference. Um, and that would be really, that's the advice that I give to the most people most of the time. Um, and why does this matter? So if you take this, image of these rocks on the beach. Uh, if the outer ring is the company and each color of rocks is a um, is a department within the organization and each individual employee is one of these little pebbles, basically what the HR, the hiring manager um, is trying to do is see if you fit into one of these open roles that they have in their organization. Um, but when they're receiving resumes, this is what it looks like. They're just getting a ton of candidates from all over the place and each person's resume looks different. And really what you want your resume to do for you is to have HR picking it out as the one that they want to do the phone screen and then hopefully the in-person interviews or the video interviews um, to, to get the role. Um, and in the environment right now, it's pretty competitive. I, I feel like jobs have just been competitive uh, for, for a while, probably the last couple of decades. And I know after the Great Recession, it was like for every one city job that was opening up, there were 4,000 applicants, which literally this for more than the the pile in this picture. So it's just really important to give yourself the at least the leg up in, in doing these small edits to your resume that can really make it clearer for someone that you're more qualified than the next person over. And then a few other things to consider are that people may have already had the job title multiple times and you're trying to apply for it new, you're trying to apply for a promotion. Um, and people may have worked at several companies in the industry while you're trying to break into a new industry, or people have had exactly the same projects and tasks as those in the job description, and you're maybe saying you have transferable skills, but not the exact skills, um, or people know the exact same software as you, um, or they have relevant cert certifications or degrees recently, but this is why it's really important to pay attention to your cover letter, your skills and experience sections of your resume to really make it stand out what qualifies you for the role, especially if you're really excited about it. If it sounds like something that you would be very qualified for, then you really want to make that show in your materials. Oh, and then from the employer's perspective, there's also several factors that are affecting how your resume gets read. So for example, if it's a large enough company, they might be sending your resume first through an e-reader, like it's a computer reading it, not even a human being. So then the words really matter because someone's not gonna put two and two together and realize that, oh, this thing that you're calling something else is actually the same thing as that thing you're calling. Or it might even, be better because maybe they did program the computer to read it like that versus a human being reading your resume wouldn't know that this software that you use is similar to what they're asking for with this other software that they use. Um, and then it might be it might be an HR professional reading your resume or it might be someone who is not um, like professionally trained at processing resumes. So for example, in one place where I worked, our HR department was focused on the hiring of the property management um, positions because that was approximately 90% of the company. And so for the other 10%, the corporate office jobs, all those departments like IT communications um, had to, and operations had to do their own they processed, like we had to read the resumes ourselves, even though we were not the HR professionals um, and be screening for people. So 
it is just want to make sure that the wording is friendly to everyone, somebody who knows the job and someone who doesn't know the job. You just want to make sure that you're still being clear about your qualifications and skills. And then someone may be reading it digitally on the computer, uh, in which case the font size doesn't really matter because they can zoom in or out. But if it's a printed version, um, so for example, another place I worked, um, I would just screen through some resumes and then print them to give to the next person. And you want to make sure that the printed version is also easy to read, um, just in case that's how that the next the second person is looking at it. Um, and in most cases, it is usually a short staff department or there are open roles for a reason. So people possibly may only be giving your resume, I wanna say even less than a two minute review, they could be skimming depending on, you know, if they get if they get 20 candidates, they'll probably spend time reading the resumes, but if they get a thousand, they're not gonna be doing anything more than skimming your resume just for the keywords. And if it mostly looks relevant, they'll look again. If it mostly looks irrelevant, they, they will just toss it. And you might be really qualified, but if you didn't spend the time to take out the non-relevant things on your resume, then you're just gonna miss out on this job that could have been great for you. Um, oh, I have a few questions in the chat. So do you need to add numbers to every sentence or is it okay to just put one step for experience? Um, yeah, it doesn't have to be every sentence. I think it, it's just where it will make a difference, right? So for example, some of these jobs, you might be, you may be applying against someone who graduated from your same graduate degree or from your same undergraduate degree uh, program. And so some of the things on your resume will be the same. So what can you say compared to another person that will be a number that is um, competitive? So for example, if you're applying to a large place and you worked with large teams, then, then you would wanna say that number instead of the employer not knowing that the scale of your company was similar in scale to that company. Or similarly, if you're working at a small place and you wanna say like, I have small business experience, then you wanna put those kinds of numbers. Um, what if you don't have or can't get specific metrics regarding your performance? Then um, I, I might just, if you can estimate, that's helpful. Like if you have an idea that you maybe processed 20 people a week, or um, if you can ask old coworkers who still work at the place where you used to work about the volumes. Um, otherwise, I mean, don't make things up. So just, you can just leave it out. But there are different ways to get different numbers. It doesn't always have to be the, like standard ones that people think of there yeah, can be a creative um and then one more question doctor's license I'd like to know if there's some institutions that can help immigrant doctors transfer work from other countries to the u.s okay uh i will leave that to angela okay thanks angela all right so going on so here we have candidate C and D. Um, and if you want to just put into the chat which candidate looks more qualified, um, this is kind of a trick question because they're kind of the same candidate again. But um, cool, we have one vote for D, which I would suggest turning your resume into bullet points if possible. Um, sometimes it's nice to have narratives because you get the voice, which is the candidate C wrote it out in paragraph form. Um, but nowadays, it's like people just don't have time anymore. <laughs> There's like no work-life balance in this country. Everybody's in a rush and it's just easier to read bullet points. Um, and you have the cover letter where you can include your voice and kind of put more of the narrative back into it. Um, and the nice thing about turning your sentences into bullet points is that you can then categorize them. So I kind of alluded to these categories before in the last 
set. Um, but basically, there are three different types of bullets you would have in your resume. One is job functions, um, which I noted with an F here. One is projects and one is achievements. And ideally, you go, you could go through your resume and each sentence or each bullet point note, are, are you talking about a project? Are you talking about an achievement? Or are you talking about a job function? Um, and this is kind of one of my not pet peeves, but it's just like you look more organized if you put similar things together. So if you put all the functions together, then you list the projects, then you list the achievements. Or even if you're applying to a project based position, then you would want to put your project examples first, and then you can put either achievements of those projects and then list your everyday job functions. So if you have it in bullet point form, it's easier to move things around to make it in the order that's most impactful to the place where you're applying. And then for the next employer where you're applying, if they care more about the, if, if your job functions were more relevant, are more relevant to the position you're applying for, you can move those to the top, you move the projects to the bottom, et cetera. And doing this exercise also helps you realize redundancies in your resume. Sometimes people write the same thing twice in different sentences and just it's like somewhere in the paragraph. And people don't really have time to keep rereading the same things over. So it's just helpful because you have a better visual view of everything you're saying in your resume. And then you can do this categorization of the bullets so that they're in the most effective and organized order. Um, someone asked a question, what about your profile? Should you keep that in sentence form? I think if you mean like an online profile summary or something, um, yeah, you could use either. Um, if you use bullet points below, then it could be nice to keep the descriptive paragraph at the top in sentence form. Um, I think just think about it, whatever is easiest to read. So if you're, if you take yourself outside of your own body and you're reading your resume as a, an external third party, is it easier to read the paragraph or is it easier to read the bullet points? So our next exercise is using some bullet points in your own resume. So if you wanna just go through your resume and kind of note next to each sentence, is this an F, is this a P, is this an A? Uh, and you can, kind of determine whether or not you need to reorganize the order. So Fs are things that are daily, regularly recurring, annual, semi-annual, quarterly. Ps, projects, are things that have phases. So it had like a beginning, a middle, an end, where you planned, you executed, conducted post-evaluation, for example. Um, and the interesting thing with projects is that, you know, oftentimes projects involve multiple people. So especially if you're in a large corporation, the project could have involved like 200 people across how many offices abroad and in the country. Um, and you really want to highlight what was your role relative to others. So sometimes people just write they worked on a project, but it's like, 200 of you guys all said the same thing on your resume that you worked on this project, like which thing did you do in that project? Um, and then also what's helpful is the duration or some impressive numbers could be how many people did you have to coordinate with on the project team? Like how many time zones did you have to coordinate with or how many people together had to work on it in your office? And this is a chance for you to list what tools you used. So this, is kind of like the, a good balance to your skills section where you list the skills and software and tools that you have used. But this is kind of a way to show where exactly you used those. Um, and then for achievements, uh, could be key performance indicators of your company or if you have a strategic plan or annual goals that you set um, and that you've met or processes that you've improved. Usually um, achievements is where people already have numbers on their resume, but you can include them in the other sections as well. And 
there's a question. What would you recommend one page or two page resume? So I think is that next? No, not yet. But I would say uh, two page resumes are fine. I would not try to squeeze everything into one page unless you're doing that in a way that it just looks, I mean, it just happens to fit in a page, then yeah. But don't try to squeeze it in, like don't try to make it really small. Um, I think longer than two is kind of like you didn't take the irrelevant stuff out. Um, so what I usually do is I have one gigantic resume file of every, like my master file of each job, how I would describe it the long way and how I would describe it the short way. And then when I'm applying somewhere, I ask myself, does this job, which is this job relevant to the role I'm applying for? If it is, you know, keep the long one. If it's not, keep the short one. And then just like cut, 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 cut until it's down to two, less than two pages. Um, since, as I said, people don't have a lot of time to read through your resume. You want to make sure that everything in there is relevant to the role. Um, and another thing is that visually, um, you know, sometimes people have been at a job for 15, 20, or 30 years, and it's just been that much of their life that they want to give it that much of the space on their resume. And that's okay if, if what you're applying for is related to that. But if you're trying to change routes to go into what you studied, but not what you worked in, or if you're trying to just switch fields or something, or you're trying to like hop back into the workforce into a, like some old job that you had years and years and years ago, uh, you really want to upplay that section. You, you want to expand what's relevant and you want to minimize what's irrelevant. So even though it was 50, even though it was several decades of your life, if it's not related to the job you're applying for, you just want to cut it down to like talk about what was relevant and then uh, spend more time, you know, expanding your education section or expanding what's relevant. Like it, uh, one person whose resume was mostly, I think their resume was mostly customer service and like they were trying to go into art curation and they had studied art history. But, you know, when you have education at the end of your resume, people won't realize that you do have relevant experience. You do have relevant skills that you learned in school if you don't move education to the top. So in that instance, even though the education was like decades before, I would still move that to the top, talk about what was my thesis project, what, what were my courses, and list things that are all relevant keywords to the job that you're applying for because that's that's what's relevant to them and that's what background you have in that subject and take the customer service and just cut it really down until there's enough space where the ratio of the relevant is higher than the ratio of the irrelevant. <laughs> How do you balance adding information with trying to keep white space and ease of reading? Um, I'm not I, I'm not big on white space, even though I know it's good for everybody. Um, so I think it's just like the content is really what matters on your resume. Even formatting doesn't really matter. I'll show some examples later, which are all more on the graphic design field. So they're a little out there, but um, yeah, I, I think it's just like, how would you describe your job to someone who doesn't know what you did? And it, yeah, it's like the, the analogy I had, was thinking about recently is like, if you have a friend who really likes giraffes and you went to the zoo, um, you wouldn't like, you wouldn't tell them all about like all the other animals that you saw and like blah, blah, blah. Like if you went to the zoo and you fed giraffes, right? You would come to this friend and you would say, I just went to the zoo and I fed the giraffes. You wouldn't say like, I just went to the zoo and I saw the lions, I saw the bears, I saw the tigers, I like, and the, I saw the monkeys and then like I fed the giraffes. It's like, you know, they don't care about that. They just care about the giraffe part. So just like get to the, get to the content that they care about. Um, if you cut your resume down to two pages, should you mention an aligned selected jobs only? 
Oh, um, I, I wouldn't cut the jobs out completely. Like I would still list the employer and the dates so that it doesn't look like a gap. Um, but then I would just list one bullet point or two bullet points that are relevant, if any are, or, or you know, if there aren't, then just like list the employer, but not show a gap. Okay, so um, perfect question. Any tips on identifying the right keywords from a job description? So um, the other thing with resume reviews is that I, I, my next question is always like, what is a job that you're trying to apply for? Because that's where it's really important. And this is really the part that gets you to the interview. So highlighting keywords in the job description, like if you take a job description, pull out keywords first, then you highlight them in some way where you never have to reread the entire description again later. But this is a good exercise because it, you make sure that you're including everything that might be important that you can say that's relevant from your experience. So in this example of a government affairs lead, it just highlighted some keywords that I would call out as important. So policy frameworks and governance protocols with governments, companies, civil society. So it's basically like kind of specific things that they say, you know, like industry vocabulary that they use. Um, they're saying with governments and academic institutions, policy and governance and the fourth industrial revolution, which I don't know if that's their own term or they're using that as like a nice way to describe the future. And then here they describe some locations, specifically San Francisco, Geneva, Mumbai, Beijing, Tokyo, affiliate strategy, engagement teams. So, and note that instead of general public, they call them civil society. Um, and instead of like universities and schools, they call them academic institutions. So it's, you know, it's very minor, but this, these are the words that they're looking for. So instead of using the vocabulary you had before, if you can change it to this vocabulary, you want to. So these are some places where you will want to use the keywords in your resume when you're describing work experiences or job functions, um, in your objective, in your skill summary, and in your cover letter. So here, for example, are two candidates, E and F. So if we look at them, they both have the same years of experience. They both worked in San Francisco. Um, but which, which of these two candidates looks more qualified, would you say? Um, yeah. So I would definitely say candidate E, even though they're, they might have the exact same skills, candidate E sounds extremely more qualified for this role than candidate F. Uh, and, oh. and yeah, you can just see from the keywords. So one common question that I have heard is what if I'm trying to change into a new field? Um, and actually, there's another question uh, in the chat. What if I have a 14 year gap when I stayed home with my kids? Should I address that? Yes, you can definitely address that. Um, you can write it into your cover letter. And then also, if there was anything else that you were doing in your that gap, like if you were participating in things related to the schools or if you were volunteering doing something else, you can still put that in to your experience section and just retitle it instead of calling it work experience, you could call it experience um, and showcase anything else you were doing. Um, so one thing you can do if you're trying to switch into a new field is volunteer. Uh, you can also emphasize your education, as I was describing before, where if your education was related to the field, then definitely describe, be more descriptive of what you did in school, in your program, um, and include all relevant work. So for example, I had a friend who was doing customer service, but was trying to go into IT. 
and had nothing really about IT on his resume. And it, but even though he had done years of work helping family and friends as their unofficial IT person. So that kind of hobbyist stuff is still extremely valuable experience and it explains to the employer why you're even interested in their position so that should definitely make it onto your resume like any hobby uh if you can say it in a way where if you were part of an association or a group that's even better but even if you weren't just noting in your interest section or just listing it even as an experience on your resume that for X to X years, which is usually like 10, 15, like your whole life, you've just been doing this, like you've been the auto person for your, the, the mechanic for your friends and family. Like make sure to put that on there if that's the role that you're trying to apply for and that's your only relevant, like officially unofficial experience, um, it should definitely have a spot on your resume. Um, and then, Oh, as I was saying before, one of the common mistakes is giving irrelevant details too much space and then not sharing enough relevant details. So yeah, keep the job titles and the dates for the flow on your resume, but delete everything else that is not relevant because it's just gonna catch their eye. They're gonna read the irrelevant thing and then throw your resume out because they're like, what, what job is this person applying for? So um, we did we did for one time get a, a resume that had, it, it seemed to have no relevant experience, um, but then we read the cover letter, which is why I think cover letters are really important. Um, and she was describing, you know, uh, like growing up in affordable housing, et cetera. And so there was actually a story where it made sense why she was applying to our company. Um, and we actually referred her to a different position or to a different department if in case they were hiring. So it was nice. She got an internal referral out of submitting that cover letter because otherwise the resume gave no indication of like why she was applying for the role. Um, and two page resumes are ideal, as I said, um, keep the font size large enough to read 10 or 12 point font um, or 11. And, or if they give you specific instructions, of course, follow the instructions that they provide. Uh, okay, so our next exercise is aligning your experience with the role. So hopefully you brought a job description, but if you did not, we're going to find one right now. So there are a lot of places online where you can find a job listings. I think if people want to throw into chat the chat like common ones that you use, feel free. Uh, and this is just a sampling. The ones in bold with the triangle are ones that I uh, typically use more myself. So Craigslist.org, Indeed.com. Um, calops.org for government jobs, jobapps.com slash SF for city of San Francisco. Oh, and you can get this list on my website, which is resume workshop sf.wordpress.com, which actually has a copy of this presentation uploaded too, if you wanna look back through the presentation. So, oh, and just a quick keyboard shortcuts on taking a screenshot on your computer on a Mac, you could press Command Shift 3, which saves to the desktop, or on a PC, you can press your print screen button and then Control V to paste the image into Word or PowerPoint. Oh, and Angela threw the link to the website in the chat. Thanks. Uh, we have a question. What's the typical sequence of reading resume and cover letter? Do they both get read? Length of cover letter, one page as well. Oh, okay. So I have a little section about cover letters at the end of this presentation. Um, but I would say keep your cover letter short, obviously, since people, you know, they're only skimming. Um, like, 
I would say like half a page or less. Um, and it's a good question. I always think to myself, should I read the cover letter first or should I read the resume? Um, I'm not sure what people do, <laughs> uh, but it's, yeah, I, I can't, I would have to, I would have to do it again in order to see which which order makes sense. <laughs> um, but let's run a search. So ssbay.craigslist.org. And I like Craigslist because the posts are live. Like someone had to post it. It's not just crawling the web for anybody's job postings, which might be out of date because the webmaster hasn't updated the website. And then you spend like two hours updating your resume just to find out that you're applying to a job that's no longer available. So Craigslist is nice because typically if the post is up, the job is still, they're still hiring for it. And uh, it's one of the few places on the website where the you have to pay for the post, it's not free. So there's like a little bit of a screening mechanism. I mean, obviously that's not a complete screener. I would still say like if, if they don't give any information about who they are, like what their company is, and like you can't look them up, then if it sounds sketchy, skip it. But if it, if if it's you know they provide all the information, it's a nice place to find job listings for like small to mid-sized places. So let me open up. So sfbay.craigslist.org. Um, we'll pull up the Craigslist for the Bay Area. And then here there's a job section and there's also all these drop downs to pick a specific category. But instead of doing that, I would just run all the jobs. So you can just see everything that's out there. Um, and the nice thing about this is that you can change it. So oh, if I, I only want to do somewhere Muni goes, you can choose San Francisco, it'll filter. And then if you only are looking in certain job categories, you can come down the left side here and deselect all. And I think on the call today, if I scroll back in the chat, Oops, I lost the chat. One sec. Pull up the chat again. Start my screen sharing. Okay, I know we had somebody nonprofit, my favorite. Um, and we had some strategist designer. So we can turn on our media design. We had some healthcare IT. And then we had medicine. Uh, I'm not seeing. Oh, I choose government. science and biotech. All right, okay, so we'll say those are the ones that we're interested in. And then we can come down here and say, oh, pick neighborhoods. So for example, if you only want options that are accessible by BART, then you can do downtown Pacific Center, Financial District, Glen Park. And Mission District, you can just choose whichever neighborhood you're interested in. Um, since right now, if you'll notice, there's three that there's more than 3000 listings, which is crazy. And you don't want to sift through them yourself. You want the computer to do it for you. So we just select those. And then um, I skip checking any of these in case the person filling out the form didn't check things. Um, and I just want to see all 
So update search, and now we only have 66. So that is much more reasonable to go through. And once you get it to a good list that looks like, oh, I would apply to a lot of these, um, you know, save it. You can either um, bookmark it using your browser and just add a bookmark and say, set jobs. And it'll just, you know, be there so that tomorrow or next week when you feel like doing applications, you can come back to your browser, click the button, and it'll run the same search, which is this search here. So you can email this link to yourself so you can open it next time too, um, if you don't have a Craigslist account where you can save the search. So we just look through here and find a job of interest. Oh, that's causing using admin, cool. All right, so there we have a job post, great. So I would copy and paste this to myself so that I can highlight some of the keywords to read through it once and make sure I include some of those in my cover letter and resume. Um, so indeed.com is another site that's good for also small, mid-size, mid to large companies. Um, and at the bottom, so usually a lot of these sites have this keyword search. And sometimes it's hard to think of like, what's the one keyword that describes what job I'm looking for? I mean, if you have a job, where you know what the keyword is, then it's easy. But if you're open to different things and just looking to see what's out there, you can also go to the bottom, the very bottom and just press browse jobs. And it's nice, like that's the nice thing about Craigslist too. You can just kind of see all the jobs and get ideas in case you don't know exactly what you're looking for. Um, and then for local and city government, um, jobapps.com slash SF is the city and county of San Francisco. So since it's large enough, they have their own website. And what's nice is that you can see all the job descriptions of any job they're ever hiring for, um, not just the ones that are available like today or right now. So you can go in there, see all the roles that they have. You can sign up for alerts to be notified when that classification becomes available. So it's it's kind of nice. Um, and you can just you know get an idea of different job titles. Um, CalOps.org is for cities, counties, and other jurisdictions that are just smaller and don't have their own dedicated website. Um, you can sign up for like city of daily city city of brisbane kind of alerts also um similarly and those just get emailed to you like once a week or so so it's a manageable amount of emails it's not like every day you're getting bombarded um and then also you can just look up the top companies in the industry that you're hoping to work in and go directly to their websites because maybe they don't post anywhere. Maybe they're just so popular and they get enough applicants that they never post to any job boards. Um, and just at the bottom of their website somewhere, find the careers. They might even have a separate careers website. So here's our next candidate comparison. So candidate G is on the left um, and candidate H is on the right. And as you'll notice, they have the exact same experience, but when you're looking at their resume, yeah, which one looks like the stronger candidate, we already have a vote for G. <laughs> um, and I would also say, yes, I think candidate G looks stronger. Um, and this has come up because, you know, a lot of people in San Francisco are web developers, software engineers, et cetera. And like typically their skill summary all looks the same as everybody else's who's applying to the job. So it's almost like, why even have that section if you're not going to say how you're different than everybody else? Like, 
Everybody has the same skills, but really on the left is helpful because there are categories, there are, it's not levels of proficiency, but there are years of experience. Um, and it's just, you know, it takes up more space, which is why I'm saying you don't have to limit yourself to only a page because a lot of the stuff I'm suggesting adds a little bit more content to your resume, but, um, but you want to add this helpful content. So our next exercise is crafting your skill summary to be specific. Um, and here's one example of someone who has very specific skills and also they included like recognition that they've received, but basically quantitative and statistical analysis, demographic analysis and working with census data, GIS software, Adobe Creative Suite, like these are very Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Um, like I, I get the question a lot, like, aren't these a given for my role? Like they're gonna know that everybody has these skills like Microsoft Excel or something, but it's like not everyone knows Excel. And also if it's an HR person looking at the resumes before the hiring manager looks, they might not know the things that are typically expected of in your role. So you still wanna detail out you want to detail out everything because that's also the keywords that would get picked up by the e-readers. It would get picked up by the human readers and it would just, you know, no one's going to assume that, you know, Excel, for example, unless you say it, even if, even if it's a predominantly used software in your industry, it's just helpful to just put it on there. Um, yeah, and then this is an example too of where they put the relevant projects for their education. So crafting your skill summary to be specific and relevant. Um, another thing is that sometimes people have generic skills on their resume, like good communicator, team player. That is very subjective because you're the one self-describing it. Um, and it also is kind of like all of us applying to the job are probably these things like who have worked in a workplace. I mean, not necessarily, but, you know, it doesn't help distinguish you from others. So what you want to do is spend this section listing more specific things such as job functions that you've had, old titles, um, software that you know languages that you speak, the levels of proficiency. And I think one important thing that you could put here is the population types or audiences um, that you've served or, or industries or fields that either you have worked with or that your company has worked with. So for example, if you were selling insurance, was it to, was it to commercial like companies or was it to individuals? Are you doing B2B, B2C? And then, or if you're in property management and you've been working with seniors you, and you're applying to a place that's asking for senior level experience um, or like, as opposed to working with families or youth or something, or, or conversely, if you were trying to apply for a families and youth place, then you can write that in. So applying on company website versus going through a job board if listed in both, what would be your recommendation? Oh, I would definitely use the company website. Um, at, maybe people are starting to rely on job board more now, but still it's like job boards are still the secondary where you, it might not be up fully up to date as opposed to the company website. Or maybe people are moving in the direction where they're relying on the job boards and like not involving themselves with their IT person who's running their website. So, uh, but yeah, I guess just double check and then don't be too sad if both of them are out of date and the job's not available anymore. Um, and then categorize your skills. So it's just helpful to read it if it's categorized. Um, and if you notice that these job postings are all asking for this software you've never heard of. Like, what is Salesforce? I mean, you definitely you'll want to look it up. Um, and if you can, 
volunteer somewhere or intern somewhere where you can get that experience so that it's something that you can add to your resume to make it more competitive if this is really the role that you're trying to pursue and they keep asking for it um, or take a certification or a free course online. So via the San Francisco Public Library, you can take um, some online courses that would otherwise cost a subscription. Uh, and you can take them for free using your library cards. So if we go to sfpl.org. Oh, there, Angela put it in the chat. But it's under here, research and learn, e-learning. Um, you can pull them up, but one example is Gail, and Linda is now actually LinkedIn Learning. Um, but for example, here are some of the things that you could take on Gail. You can take computer applications, composition, healthcare, medical, legal, education, publishing, etc. So just check it out. Uh, one time we had a candidate who had like 12 or 13 online courses that she had taken, even though she didn't have a degree in design, it was great that she was keeping her skills or like gaining the skills that she needed for the role. Um, as opposed, and it's helpful too, because it adds something recent onto your resume. So for example, if you're, you got your education a long time ago and you're concerned about age discrimination, one way to reduce the chance of that is by having research, recent certifications and free courses that you took recently that you list with the years on them so that it still looks like you're keeping your education up to date. Um, and then another thing you can do is if, use community colleges. I'm not sure if they're in person yet, um, but I'm not a big fan of online education. I like doing in-person stuff. so. Um, that's one nice way. Or um, conferences are a great way. And actually, um, industry conferences, like if you look up what is the professional association for this industry that I'm trying to enter into, uh, it's helpful if you attend the conference because you find out what everyone is talking about right now. You can go to sessions and see like what's the most recent things going on and then you can go to the exhibitor booths and talk with people who are probably hiring and just get the chance for a face-to-face -face without having to go through like the email, try to getting an informational interview, no one's responding to you. Um, so I highly recommend, I know co attending conferences is sometimes expensive, but if you have the chance to make the investment, you could really like get a lot out of going to one. And the plus right now of it being a lot of uh, of a lot of in person events being canceled is that people are still hosting conferences virtually, so it's like almost a cheaper opportunity to go, and you can do it from like wherever you are with your computer. Um, uh, I there's a question about Gale courses in the chat, and I am not sure. Oh, okay, there someone else answered. Thank you. Um, yeah, so highly recommend checking out any of the industry conferences at the national level or even like state level for a regional West Coast um, for your profession. Okay, so here's candidates J and K and the only difference between these two is what's in highlighted in the green here. So one thing that sometimes people don't do, like it's nice because on LinkedIn, you can go and click on the link of what's this company and find out where they worked. But if you're looking at their piece of paper resume, um, it's helpful, especially nowadays when there's so many different types of employers and like lots of startups and random companies that no one's ever heard of that you might've worked for. It's just helpful if you provide a little bit more context of what is this organization or what was your team or department. So especially if it's directly related and relevant to the job you're applying for. So for example, these two candidates, 
I mean, seemingly have the same experience unless they describe the company, in which case you find out that the one on the left is working for like a grant funded small research institution. And then the one on the right is actually working for an extremely large public organization. So depending on where they're applying, one is way more qualified than the other. And we will only know because they added the description of their company. So a couple things you can think about is either describing the company or the industry or field or your department there or the job title. So it's just something to take into consideration when you're choosing like, what should I put in bold on my resume and what should I italicize and um, so one common mistake is showing short increments instead of longevity and dedication. Um, so this actually, this was in the example at the beginning of the presentation where they had two jobs at the same hospital, but they listed them completely separately. So it looks like they're kind of hopping around. Um, and what you want to do, especially if you've been promoted in the same company, you want to visually consolidate it so that the promotions all look like part of one company with one time frame that is long instead of all these small jumps where someone who's reading your resume fast just sees like two years, two years, two years, one year. And like, oh, this person's been jumping around a lot. They're going to come on. We're going to train them and then they're going to leave. So it might be, um, I mean, like they might just have that bias without even knowing it. Uh, so it's helpful not to shoot yourself in the foot, which I had been doing on my own resume, um, by not visually consolidating promotions within the same organization. And similarly, if you did like consulting work or project based work, if you can consolidate that under the title of like one consulting role, as opposed to like six months here, three months there, it just will help. Um, make it look like this person can stay dedicated to a certain employer or employment for a period of time. It just <laughs> looks better on the hiring manager's end. So LinkedIn even learned this lesson. So they started doing this um, visual dot and line so that now when your job, you have promotions within the same organization, they look like cohesively all part of one longer time frame. Um, so just a reminder to apply that equally to your resume. Um, common questions, should I write a cover letter? I say yes, unless they say not to. And then if you don't have time and you just have to get it in before the due date, then definitely make sure to include an objective at the top, which is just a sentence kind of describing you. <clears throat> so here's a candidate with, or two candidates with their objectives. Candidate L is one that people are just like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna make an objective that applies to everything so I never have to change it. And like, you know, there's no point in anyone reading this. <laughs> like no hiring manager needs to read this because this is every candidate. Like what you want to do is spend a little bit of time to customize your resume to the organization or a lot of time if you like really want this job. Um, because this person on the right sounds extremely more qualified for the same job than the person on the left. And so there's just a few components of this objective. Um, you're highlighting where you aim to be and you wanna be specific about your background. So any like audience or constituents that you work with that are related, um, the scope or scale of your work, your fields of expertise, oops and your years of work. So for example, I'm a professional, ready to contribute my 10 years of multi-state experience, working with similar groups as yours to your social justice oriented role of whatever. Um, I mean, people will hear if you're being genuine versus like you're not really interested, you're just throwing out a hundred resumes and seeing where it catches. Um, oh, we have a question in the chat. Had a long time job doing many miscellaneous roles and tasks, wore many hats on a resume. Is that an advantage or disadvantage? So, 
yeah, I had that same issue too, where it's like I studied a couple different things. And then so I had these jobs that kind of go in different directions. And I think in that instance, you really want to make like two resumes, one resume for the one path where you pull out the more relevant things for that path. So for example, mine was like public policy kind of path. And then I had another like more graphic design communications path. And then you pull out the miscellaneous roles and tasks that are more related to that one. Um, which yeah, it happens. You do wear a lot of hats, but like you're only pulling out the ones that the employer will care about. So if you wore like 20 hats, you are still only pulling out the three that are related to the job that you're applying for and just delete the rest out and save that on your master template that you can use when you're applying to other jobs. Um, link to an online profile. So here are a few online profiles. Um, Inevitably, they're going to Google you if you don't provide some sort of online link yourself. So what you want to do is just a have a LinkedIn, probably. Um, I wasn't really pushing it that hard because I know there's like a lot of concerns about identity theft and stuff, but a lot of recruiters and a lot of companies are just like using LinkedIn as the baseline for even just searching for candidates or verifying your resume or, you know, just seeing who else, like on LinkedIn, people can endorse your skills. You can write recommendations of others and they can write recommendations of you. So um, it's helpful to have a, a LinkedIn at minimum. And uh, there is the issue where, you know, <clears throat> like what I was just talking about actually, where you have two different versions of your resume, but you can only have one version of your LinkedIn. So what I was doing at the time was like, making it really sparse on my LinkedIn. So it just had my employers, but it didn't have detail. Um, and then I really just put the detail into my resume. So I give the detail that I want to give that employer. I give the detail that I want to give that employer on my resume, but my LinkedIn, you just verify like, oh yeah, she worked at these places and these people were her colleagues. Um, and that's fine. And then the, or um, the, the other easy thing is that like, you can just pick like, if you were to describe your job in three categories, like I did graphic design, social media, and marketing at this place. And you can just put those three categories instead of line by line describing your functions, just those like high level of whatever you're, especially the ones most relevant to what you're trying to get next, you know, highlighting those. Um, there's other websites, so portfolium.com is uh, where you can have like presentations, spreadsheets, and other stuff. Like it was mostly for students who don't have like a visual portfolio, but still have other things that they can showcase as work um, samples. And then there's these website building websites like Weebly or Wix. WordPress is more like text based. Um, or Behance.net is for designers where you can create a visual portfolio. So like if you're doing, um, actually, I don't know if it's really, like if you do construction or something or you have things where landscaping, where you have like visual things that you can stick up on a website, you can make like a Weebly website or a Wix website or even a WordPress. Um, but it's just helpful to have some sort of online presence and they're all free. So, oh, and then also um, you can use Twitter, which I think is a really helpful tool for getting real-time news of companies. So uh, if you, you know, you create a Twitter account, you can follow companies that you're interested in or companies where you applied so that if you do get called in for an interview, you kind of have a know of what's most recently been happening with them because usually they'll post their press releases there or their recent news. Um, you can follow local governments, you can follow, I follow a lot of design blogs um, and just people in the industry. So you know what people are talking about right now. And if you need to do extra research before your interview, it's just a good place to get content. So I'm gonna cover, show a few design examples and then go into the cover letter in our last 15 minutes. Um, but here's someone with a website and just this, this one kind of had short lengths until their last job, but um, 
it might be like school related. And just in terms of US resumes, um, I know in other countries, it's sometimes customary to include a photo or a description of your family, but those things you would remove for uh, um, resume writing in the United States. Um, and the one on the right has a website and they list what languages they're proficient in and how proficient. Like I like having one accent color, not not like all the colors on the left one, but on the right, just one color that makes things stand out, especially for the um, digital version of your resume. It's kind of nice. The downside of that right one is that they have like a very small font. So I would just increase the font size. And then, so here on the right, this person minimizes irrelevant work. Like they kind of gray it out. They'll leave it there if you wanted to look at it. And they list all their main skills at the top, which is nice, along with a headline. So that's uh, like LinkedIn kind of makes you have a headline too. And it's nice if you have a headline of your resume kind of just describing like, who are you? I'm a UX designer or whatever, you know, like I'm an accounting professional or something that kind of just gives the gist of um, who you are and what you're applying for. Uh, and then they have these specific main skills listed. So. UX researcher, information architect, usability testing, design, visual design, um, interaction design, front end development. Um, the person on the left has their own awards and publicity. Like this is a chance to say like, I had this successful art installation or I was acknowledged as whatever. Um, and if you have links to things that people would find online, you can include the links. This person includes references and I typically would not include the references because it's a given. You don't even have to say like references available upon request. It's, a, it's kind of a given that if you're in the interview round, then they will ask for your references after. So you don't want to upfront give them references since you don't know where the conversation is gonna go. You don't know who you're gonna want to list as your references. So just save those for later. Um, and it's like easy and linear. So this was the one I was showing before. And the nice thing about this one was that they, they include all their relevant experiences in their work experience. So one was an internship, one was as a planning and designer, and one was a graduate teaching assistant. Like if it's all related to the one you're applying for, then just like call it experience. Um, they have the headline. Uh, yeah, so that was just a few examples, and you can get uh, some more resources on my website, resumeworkshopsf.wordpress.com. So I have a sample resume that you could download from there, and then there's also a few other um, blogs about making a chronological resume versus making a functional resume. Um, the checklist from this presentation is there. And yeah, so, and just a reminder, when submitting your resume files, uh, when you're submitting your resume, just have someone else review it to just see that the language sounds okay. And you're not using like insider language from your last company. Um, run a spell check. I, we get a lot of, not a lot, but I'm always surprised when we get resumes that have spelling errors and punctuation errors because you're trying to put your best foot forward plus it's there is a spell check feature that you can just run um, and you can have a formal email address if you don't you can set one up for free and put the job title and your name in the subject line so that'll make it stand out a little bit from everybody else's that just has the job title um, and what you can do is if you write a cover letter, you can use that as your email and then attach it still and or attach your resume as a oh, attach your resume as a PDF or if you're submitting it online and they only take one upload, you can stick the cover letter into the resume PDF and then upload that. Um, so if someone asked these examples are visually attractive but difficult to read so our basic styles seen as less creative or attractive. oh um these are mostly for graphic designers applying to graphic design jobs but you know like the ones that i was showing at the beginning are, are totally fine like basic black and white word template bullet points like 
titles in bold is fine. Um, I don't think it's any less attractive. Um, it's probably too much for the average job. <laughs> Uh, organizing your files. Oh, so it's just helpful if you keep your own list of where you applied and, and like the job posts you applied for, because sometimes employers take down the, the listing from their website when they stop. And then it's hard for you, who's still in the process, to go back and look at what you applied for unless you saved a copy for yourself. Um, and yeah. This is kind of what I was saying, like cutting down the master copy into the two pager that you're going to send in and then save that with the company name and date that you were sending it so that you're you can find it later. Because, um, for example, like one time I got called back like two or three months later, at which point I thought I was like it was a volunteer position that I had recently applied for. But then it was actually an employer who I had like no recent records of. So I had to go back in my files and pull out like, what was the resume that I sent them so that I know what I can talk about? Like, I don't know what they're looking at. Um, I, so I had to call them back the next day because I didn't, I had uploaded it to their system. So I had no email records and it was just like, eventually I got the job. So it was like, good thing I had my records on me. <laughs> um, but our last exercise is writing a cover letter. So you want, when you're writing your cover letter to, again, use the skills and keywords they directly mentioned in the job description. So my sister has a really high level of getting callbacks and she literally takes like, you asked for this, I have this, you asked for that, I do this. And it's pretty effective because that's what they're looking for. Um, but if you don't wanna be that rigid, uh, what you definitely wanna do still is start with the most concrete strengths you bring. So sometimes I used to be like, oh, start with the story first. Like I've like loved you guys since I was a child, your company is amazing. But you know, that's not gonna like get them to keep reading because that's probably everybody who's applying. So what you wanna do is state why you're stronger than the candidate next door, obviously. And then something interesting or relevant about your work or your affiliations, why you like the organization, and then you can even state your preferred contact method. Um, each of these being like two sentences or so, so that your whole letter is just like half a page or less. So here's an example, um, but basically like concrete strengths tells them the why me. Um, and it's nice, you know, employers always wanna know where you found the job posting because they're always trying to figure out where to market their jobs. Um, but here, like, strongest strengths these are words exactly out of the job description that are if, if you have that background you know say it and say it the way that they said it and that's the why me and then the next paragraph is like the i'm passionate so if the candidate next to you has the same like why me you guys both have 10 years of experience working in academic institutions and governments then the next paragraph could distinguish you. So, ooh, you have more passion than the next person. But, oh, maybe the person next to you has more passion or same passion as you. Then the next paragraph is the why you. Why are you interested in their, the, that organization? So each paragraph, you're basically trying to keep yourself as like, I'm the most qualified. I'm really interested in this. And I'm really interested in your organization because the next person over might be saying the same things that you're saying. So you just wanna keep you know, setting yourself apart. Um, and yeah, that is it. <laughs> so I know that's a lot, but you can go back and get it online. Um, if you have any questions in the last few minutes, let me know. I'll go back to this actually. So in case you wanna just start outlining a cover letter. <clears throat> um, so, oh, and then in order to email the librarians, you can reach them at bizsidetech at sfpl.org. And then if you want to email me, it's libraryworkshopcg at gmail.com. Um, I don't check it all the time. So I just have to, I would encourage you to email the librarians first since I'm just a library volunteer, but um, yeah, feel free to reach out and I'll go back to this.
and ask if anyone has any questions. So will there be time at the end for you to take a look at my resume for feedback? So I do um, do resume, I'm doing resume feedback by email right now. So if you go onto my website, uh, you can fill out the request form and just send me your resume and a job that you're interested in looking at. And I can just email you some feedback. Um, so feel free to shoot it over. What is your email again? Here, libraryworkshopcg at gmail.com. But the resume feedback is through a form that's on the website. So you can just go to resumeworkshopsf.wordpress.com. And then on there too, there's all those other resources that I was talking about earlier, um, which is this resume review checklist to do your own review and the writing a cover letter and kind of like a general downloadable template. So if you want to just stay on and start working on your own resume um, or start working on a cover letter, feel free. Otherwise, if there's no other questions, I guess we can wrap up. And yeah, uh, I just want to say actually that um, I it's like, even if you do all of this and you start applying, it's possible that you won't hear back from places because just like the market is so crazy. And it, I know it's like an uphill struggle to apply for jobs and to be motivated to keep doing it week after week. So just, you know, if you keep trying it and it's not working, then I would say like, you know, go back through some of the suggestions and like try something different or like try making a functional one. Definitely get, um, get others to look at it to just give you some input on it. Um, and yeah, it it's, it's not just, gonna happen overnight like it well it would be nice if it does like you might luck out and it'll be the first job you apply for they call you right back but it yeah it's the struggle but I know there are jobs out there for people that you can do what you want to do and what you love to do and um you know have it make a living for yourself so I would say don't give up on trying to like switch out of if you don't like what you're doing definitely try going for something different um and it'll take time but i, I it's like even mine I, I was applying for affordable housing job like i was in graphic design for a while um it, which was like a, a tangent from where i wanted to be and it took like three years for someone to finally like pick up on my resumes and applications and even then it's like fine like once you break in you know then it's really easy to move around once you're inside where you're trying to be so it just takes a lot of that investment up front um what's the spacing single or double uh i usually use single spacing and just include the extra space between the sections um but whatever looks easiest to read can you also look over portfolios? Oh, interesting question. I mean, maybe. <laughs> I haven't really gotten that before, but yeah, I'm always happy to. It's nice, like SF State, where I went for grad school, they had a resume review of portfolio night where they would call back like alumni from the program and then all the students could just showcase their portfolios to some of the um, alumni who were working in the field. And yeah, it's kind of fun, um, sure. <laughs> All right, uh, that's all the questions. Um, good luck, everyone. And yeah, you can do it. Thank you, Christina, for taking the time to share with us your knowledge and expertise on resume writing and cover letter writing. I also like to thank everyone for joining us. I hope you found the presentation informative and helpful to you. I'll be sending out an evaluation survey along with the 
a link to the recording later this afternoon or later this evening, I should say. And I would really appreciate it if you guys can take the time out of your day to fill out the evaluation so we can improve in our programs. Thank you all again. Have a wonderful rest of the evening. Goodbye, everyone.